Hi, I'm Gavin Haverstick with Haverstick Designs. I'm Ryan Brinkworth. And this is The Sound Project. So today we're going through some of the top things that can hurt someone's isolation in their studio. Yeah. Um, so, and there's a lot that goes into that between things that like sound going out of your room, but then also you have to take into account things outside of your space that could come in. Yeah. Um, I know like on a lot of the, my initial calls, like it's just how close are your neighbors? Like, do you have to worry about someone mowing their grass? Or we recently had someone that lived next to an airport. So we yeah. had to take into account they have airplanes flying over them all the time. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot that goes to it. There's so much. I mean, we, a lot of times if, if we're talking to someone initially, we'll get their address and I, I'll pull it up on Google Maps and just yeah. see if there's train tracks that are close or airports, like you said. Or I look at hospitals too, because yep. if they're near a hospital, then, then potentially you're going to have ambulances, helicopters, things like that that are going to fly through. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're always worried about the sound that's going to leak into the studio, but then also the sound that leaks out and maybe you're going to disturb neighbors or other people that you live with. And uh, isolation is just a it's a hot topic you know everyone is is wanting to be able to be in their rooms and be creative at all hours of the day mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot that goes into that and uh, the, today's episode we're going to focus on just some of those weak points and and uh, ways that your your isolation plan can be uh, short-circuited and and uh, we're going to go through some of those different details um, I'm going to okay. share uh, here this 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 graphic to get started uh, we've got um, uh, on the screen here uh, is is just a cross section of a of a room and there's a noise source in one side um, and then we've got uh, uh, all, all the different paths that sound can travel. You know, it, it can travel just airborne straight through the wall and that can just be um, a, a, a it's going to be contingent upon how your wall is built and, and all the different factors of, of uh, how many layers you have and, and how well it's sealed and things like that. There's also penetrations that happen down here, like electrical outlets. You've got HVAC that is daisy chained in this case where it's going up through the register and, and over and into the next room. Uh, you've got vibration paths that are going over the, the walls through the ceiling joists and then under the walls through the floor joists. And so uh, sound can just take a, a myriad of paths to get around what you think you've done well. And we're going to talk about a few of those today. Um, one of the things I think we're going to just mix it up today, uh, I ended up writing down eight different uh, potential weak links in your system, and I'm going to have you draw them out like a, like a card game. Yeah. And, and uh, that way we're not just, there's not really any way to prioritize one over the other. All of these things could hurt your system. Yep. And so I didn't want to do them in order thinking that, oh, that first one is, is the most important. I got to just look at that. All of them are important. So yep. I'm going to have you pick the first one. Let's do it. All right, what do you got? So the first one is penetrations, outlets, switches, and recessed lights. Yeah, so this is a huge one because, again, we're, we are trying to build this well-isolated room, and uh, it, we're trying to seal all the seams and all that stuff, and then with electrical outlets, for instance, we're just poking a bunch of three inch by five inch holes in the wall. Yep. And and by code, you need so many per wall and, and uh, you're gonna need them all over the place when you have a, a studio because you're gonna be plugging things in. And so right. uh, it's important to um, try to make sure those outlets aren't a weak point in your system. Yep. And uh, one thing that you can do if you want to have the, the outlets recessed, uh, what you can do is is put these putty pads underneath it. I've got an image here where it's just a, uh, they're called fire stop putty pads and you you uh, pack the back side of the outlet so it makes it as airtight as possible. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like uh, acoustical sealant when you put that in between seams of drywall or anything like that, but doing it for your entire outlet. And so sure. you just seal it up as, as tight as possible. Uh, this is another thing that we also do for conduits. Uh, after we've run conduits from room to room, when we run our wires through and test it, after it's all complete, a lot of times we pack those conduits with these putty pads so that it's airtight and sealed. Yep. Um, but that's one way of doing it. The other thing that, that can be done um, is actually just make your, your outlets and your switches surface mounted. Um, now, it, it, this can not look as nice sometimes. Sure. Uh, in this particular example that I'm showing on screen, there's a, just a really nice uh, wood box that, that's been added here, and uh, um, it, it's framed out really nice and matches all the woodwork in the rest, mm -hmm. of, the, uh, rest of the room. Um, but sometimes if you just have a box sitting on the wall, it doesn't look quite as nice as a recessed, uh, not as clean looking. Sure. Um, but with this, only the wires come through, and the wires are heavily sealed and caulked. But then you have this, this outlet that is... is uh, uh, sitting proud of the wall, and it's not a, a weak point. Right. 
another one uh, thing that, that we have outlets, we have switches, we also have penetrations like uh, mic plates. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people will, again, build this amazing wall, but then recess a big 16 inch by 16 inch mic plate into the yeah. wall and, and there can be issues. We actually had one client um, that had designed everything. We designed everything really well, they constructed it, but then they put their mic plates back to back on an, on an existing wall mm -hmm. and you could just hear voices going through there. Yeah. And, and so what we typically do is we try to uh, put mic plates in boxes that are sitting on top of the wall. So like in this example, this is uh, Ocalo Studios, and uh, we have a YouTube video that's a whole a walkthrough of this space. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, down here in the corner, you can kind of see in the corner of the, of the picture here, is a mic plate, but it's a really nice box that was just built on top of the wall. So the conduits in this case actually come up through the floor, mm -hmm. and it comes up through the floor right on the other side of the wall and into this box and all the wiring happens there and then uh, the, the mic plates put on top. The other benefit of doing this is it gives you something to, uh, a surface to set things down on top of yeah. in a live room, which you, you rarely have. Um, but any sort of penetrations like that, it's it's really important uh, that we make sure that they're not going to be a weak point in your system. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, next one. Windows. Windows, okay. So we all like natural light, right? Yeah. Uh, it's something that we we uh, don't want to be in the dungeon uh, while we're, we're we're working. There's there is a a reason that the term studio tan exists because <laughs> usually we don't have windows in, in our studios. Uh, but it is nice to have some natural light. Like when we did uh, we did Tyler Joseph from Twenty One Pilots Studio in his basement, mm -hmm. um, and he wrote a couple albums in there. And then uh, just within the last couple of years, we did another studio for him where it's a, it's a sunroom that yeah. we converted into. To a studio uh, because he just was kind of tired of not having natural light and he wanted to, to switch it up a little bit. So sure. natural light can be great, but with windows causes issues because usually the windows don't have as much mass as the wall that they're sitting in. Mm -hmm. And mass is kind of the name of the game when it comes to isolation. And if you have anything in that system that is not as massive, then it can cause issues. So with, with windows, I, I have an example here that I want to show you. Um, this is a this is a graph that we have on the screen, and this is showing the transmission loss values for a couple different window types. Okay, and um, the green line on here, which you see right here, the green line is uh, half inch laminated glass. Okay, uh, the blue line is half inch plate glass. So down below here. Um, and laminated glass is just a better uh, blocker of sound. Uh, and the way it's the process that the glass is made, it's two panes of glass laminated together with a kind of an adhesive. And it just naturally is, is uh, helps to flex with that energy. And there's, there's two different thicknesses of the glass which help with the isolation piece as well. Um, but you'll notice here, in, in especially in the 800 hertz and above range, like this, this, uh, this uh, range right here, uh, anywhere to the right of that, the laminated glass performs, uh, you know, on average about five to six decibels better than a plate glass would, yeah. and and so it's really important to kind of choose the right type of glass. We always use laminated glass in our systems. Sometimes you can't get away with that for exterior glass, sure. uh, but you could do another pane of glass on the inside that is laminated. Um, and to show you uh, the difference in when you, a lot of times when we're doing windows, we're doing two panes of glass separated by a big airspace. And, and the bigger that airspace we can get, the better it's going to be. And also we like to vary the thickness of the two panes of glass. So it's not just half inch and half inch. It's nice to go like half inch and three quarters or quarter inch and half inch, uh, because everything in a system has its own resonant frequency. Yep. And if you have two of the same material in that system, certain frequencies can cut through easier than they could if you had varying materials. Sure. But this example here, we've got uh, the yellow line is actually half inch and quarter inch laminated glass with a four inch airspace. So that's this line here. And then the orange line that's below it is half inch and quarter inch plate glass with a four inch air gap. And things to notice here is that in the low frequency range, in this range here, this is like 50 uh, hertz up to 80 hertz, the laminated glass performs better. And low frequencies are where we always have our problems, uh, problem areas. So it's nice on that front. But then it gets even more severe of a difference here in this high frequency range uh, where it's, uh, you know, looks like 10 to 15 dB uh, improvement by going with laminated glass. And 
and that can just make all the difference in the world. Absolutely. So, yeah, and with Windows too, it's like not only the thickness and the air gap and all that stuff that you're you're dealing with, but you also have to make sure the windows are sealed properly sure. and that the frames around the windows aren't a weak point. Because like, sometimes right. it could be you know just really thin steel or or aluminum or something like that that if you don't seal that properly or fill it with grout or insulation of some sort, then it just bypasses the window altogether and goes around it. Yep. So. And I feel like Windows, when we're having the isolation conversation, is one of those that where everything has to be at the same STC level or you're only as good as your weakest link. Like Windows is where that conversation really comes into play between Windows and doors, it seems like. For sure. Because what you want to do is try to have all the components within your your partition uh, perform relatively the same. Sure. Because if you have, a, let's say, a wall system that has an STC of 70, but your windows that you put in there are 50, mm-hmm. you've just paid way too much for your walls. And yep. and, and so it's trying to, uh, it's not only a acoustical performance thing, but it's a budgetary thing too, is Absolutely. that you want to make sure you're spending your funds in the right way. Yep. All right. Next What's one. Next? Here we go. HVAC. HVAC. Okay. So uh, we're always trying to to build these waterproof bomb shelters, essentially, yeah. <laughs> and and trying to to make it as airtight as possible. But then we got to circulate air through there, yeah. and and uh, HVAC is a common thing. You know, you want to do things like having a separate supply and return for each noise sensitive room. Don't daisy chain them together. Uh, make sure that you're using the right types of ducts and, and, and different different sizing um, and where the air handler is located at. Uh, we actually have a whole episode that's upcoming that's just on HVAC and, and how that needs to be handled for uh, low noise and, and also to not short circuit your isolation. And so that, that episode will be coming up. But HVAC, yep. you know, we got to get the fresh air in and out and we got to do it in a responsible way so it doesn't just bypass everything that we've done. Absolutely. Okay, next one here. Air gaps. Okay, so uh, with air gaps, uh, it's it's a big thing uh, to make sure that uh, uh, you you limit how many uh, leaks and and gaps in your system there's going to be. And um, uh, you know, again, that waterproof analogy, just the smallest leak, a lot of that that water could yep. get out. Same thing happens with sound, and it doesn't take much, honestly. Um, in fact, like if you have a, a wall that's 15 foot by nine foot, mm-hmm. and you cut a hole in it the size of an electrical outlet, just yep. three inches by five inches, it can drop its STC rating in half, and, yep. and that is huge. And and so I always tell contractors when it comes to uh, leaks in your system or anything like that, uh, if you think at the end of the project you used way too much silicone caulking you yeah. probably use just enough like yeah. it, it needs to be everything sealed as as tight as possible i've got this graph that, that's uh shown here on the screen and and uh the y-axis is actually the stc uh of of what the wall would be if they had a leak in it and then the uh, x-axis is the stc if that wall had no leak in it and these different uh lines here that are shown are it's the you can see up here in the top top left, it's the area of the leak, so the square footage of the leak, mm-hmm. divided by the area of the wall, and then that associates with these different different lines. Now, to, to give you that example of that electrical outlet in a 15-foot by 9-foot wall, yeah. that would fall somewhere around here, this .0005 range, right? And so what you do is that, let's say you had an STC 55 uh, wall, down here with you design an STC 55 wall and you want it to perform like STC 55, yeah. but it has a leak in there of 0.0005. That means you come up to this line and then you go over, draw a straight line directly over and wherever it touches this axis, the Y axis, that's the STC you're actually going to get. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So STC 55 with a gap the size of an electrical outlet ends up giving you about a, a 32 and a half, 33 STC. Which is like an apartment wall. Right. I mean, exactly. That's crazy. That, like a par- typical apartment wall is like 32 to 33 STC. Yeah. So you've designed something that should be pretty good for, for a, a studio environment, but then performs no better than an apartment wall. Yeah. And it's all because of just the leaks and gaps. And it doesn't have to be one big opening like that. That that could have just been the sum of a bunch of small openings that created this area of the leak over area of the wall ratio here. So sure. it's just a huge thing. It's important to, to make sure you seal everything as airtight as possible. Look at penetrations. All these things are, are going to really matter. Absolutely. All right. Let's go for another one. Doors. 
Doors. Okay, S- same similar to Windows yeah. in that doors uh, can be a weak link because if you again build an awesome wall, but then you put a hollow core wood door with no seals in it, yep. uh, you're you're only going to be as good as that. Which that has a hollow core door with no seals has an SCC of twelve. Okay, so that is really <laughs> not doing much for you. And and so it's important to balance that out. Make sure you get a quality door from a manufacturer that that has uh, um, testing data and good seals because. Yep. The door itself, like the ones that we use, a lot of times they weigh, you know, 250 to 400 pounds a piece. Yeah. And, and uh, sometimes we're even doing communicating door systems where one will swing into the room and one will swing out of the room. And it's important to uh, make sure that you are sizing that properly so that it matches the wall performance. Yeah. And, and uh, the, the seals, I, I think, are just every bit as important as how heavy that door is. Because, mm-hmm. uh, again, it doesn't take much around the perimeter. Uh, I, I was just at a job recently where we were testing isolation, and the seals were working well. But if you pushed on the door to break the seal, mm-hmm. it, it felt like half of the sound was leaking out. And then you wow. would just let it go, and it, and it would, it would uh, um, perform well again. Yeah. So the seals... It, it, it's all in the seals and the, the the quality of the door and how heavy it is. And it's crazy, like to see the difference when it is set up properly. Something like Matthew Sutherland's, like <laughs> we have a video on our YouTube channel about it, where you start on the outside of the studio with his communicating doors closed, and then yeah. there's like you can hardly hear anything, and then you walk in and it's like, whoa, there's really loud music in here. Yeah, I love that video because we were playing at about 100 decibels inside there, and yeah. I'm having a conversation outside and talking to the camera about the isolation, yep. and you can't even hear it at all. It's 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 pretty wild. If it's done properly, uh, it can be a beautiful thing. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. All right, we got three more left. Partition, low mass, et cetera. Okay, yeah. So with the partitions in in your your system, it's all about how much mass you have and the decoupling that you're getting. Mm-hmm. And so, because sound can travel either airborne as a just directly through a structure if it has too much uh, or too little mass in your system, or it could be like a structure borne vibration. And so, there's different methods that that uh, can improve that. But if if your wall is lacking in one of them, then it can be a weak point and yeah. and travel out. And one thing that we we have done is we created this sound isolation simulator where we can uh, you can actually hear how much sound isolation you can get from various wall types. Um, we're talking with clients all the time and, and uh, uh, discussing transmission loss values and STC values, and you could see people's eyes glaze over and just be like, I, don't, I, I want it to be isolated. Well, every person has a different uh, expectation of what's actually isolated, yeah. and so that's why we created this simulator so that people could actually hear it and, and make a decision based on that. So the way that this works is that there's a no partition file here on the left-hand side. You you click on that, and you you wanna play this on speakers that, that can produce low frequencies well. Yeah. Like a laptop isn't gonna be a good demo for this because those speakers just don't produce the bass very well. Right. But decent monitors, like in your studio, uh, use your speakers in there, and you turn that, that sound up as loud as it'll safely go. Like, don't let the smoke out of your speakers, but like, <laughs> get it loud and uh, make it feel like you're in the room with a live band. Yeah. And you leave your volume set the same, and then as you scroll through uh, these different wall types, you'll notice that each wall type has a play button next to it. And if you click on that button, you'll hear the relative difference that if a live band was playing on the other side, if everything was done properly, you'll hear what it would sound like on the other side of the wall. Yep. So this first wall sample is like the apartment wall, STC 33, mm-hmm. no insulation, half inch drywall on other uh, either side of a two by four studded wall. But then there's a bunch of different wall types in here as you scroll through. And uh, each one gives an STC rating. We actually give a price per square foot for materials, yep. and then also uh, the thickness of the wall. Um, but it's it's nice to go through this example. I'll have clients tell me like, well, let me know which wall gets to the point where you're like, okay, now we're on to something, and I think I would be okay with this amount of isolation, and then. It doesn't mean we're going to design your studio to have these exact wall types. Right. It just means that we know um, what those transmission loss values are, so we can kind of shoot for that as a target when we're designing things. Yeah, yeah. That's I know when I've, whenever I'm on a call with a client because it's usually that initial call. It's just that's a great starting point just mm-hmm. to figure out where is the expectation, and then we can work from there. Absolutely. All right, two more. Got it. RC channels. 
Okay, when it comes to resilient channels and, and different types of clips and, and channel systems that are out there, yeah. uh, the main thing that they're trying to do is to decouple whatever layers you're adding onto them from the structure. So from the wall studs or from the ceiling joists. And uh, the thing that happens, unfortunately, all the time is that people will anchor those, those uh, um, channels into the studs put all their mass on it, but then screws will go through the mass, through the channel, and into the stud itself, which will short circuit that vibration path and render it, um, it, it won't render it useless, but it will make it much less effective than yeah. it could be. And it doesn't take much. Like actually there's studies that show that if you have just one screw that is is uh, short circuiting it, it can drop your STC point by, by one yeah. just with one screw. And sometimes if it's multiple screws, it can be up to 10 points difference in your STC value uh, just from just from screws being misplaced and so mm -hmm. the graphic that's shown on the screen right now is just a, a photo of uh, the back side of, of a, a stud here that shows the resilient channel properly screwed into the studs here because you screw it in at the at the bottom of the the channel and then this channel kind of goes out up and back a little bit and you screw your, your uh, drywall layers into that. Um, but this guy right here is the culprit. You see that screw, it's going through the drywall layer, through the channel, and then it penetrates the metal stud there. Yep. And that is something that you wanna try to avoid. And I always uh, get asked the question like, well, what length of screw can I use to go through all of that but not penetrate into the stud? Mm -hmm. And it's a great question, but it's an easier answer because you actually just mark where the studs are and then never screw at that location. Right. It's kind of counterintuitive that we're used to, uh, but it's important because at that point, you could use whatever length of screw you want because it's only gonna end up in the cavity between the studs yep. and not actually hit the stud. So that's really important. Make sure that you're not short circuiting any vibration path. Same thing goes for like a floated floor. If you floated your floor, but then you have one piece of your floor that's touching, uh, you know, that's gonna be a vibration path and, and um, kind of diminish what you, you could have accomplished. Yep. All right, the last one. What is the last one? Let's see. Impact noise. Okay, yeah. So impact noise will uh, really hurt your isolation. Um, I, we're doing a lot of studios in basements yeah. for, for uh, clients, and, and uh, directly above them could be the kitchen or a hallway, something with a hard floor. Mm -hmm. And someone running across that or, you know, that thud that you would hear, or if they have hard-soled shoes, or if they move a piece of furniture and you hear that, that vibration noise down in your basement. Yep. It's uh, unfortunately kind of bearer of bad news here, but um, things that you do inside of your studio can lessen it, but it usually doesn't completely knock it out because the way that you address those impact noises is to address it at the source, like where it's actually happening. So uh, it's a pain, but that it actually means like ripping up the floor above and using underlayments and things like that underneath that floor above to be a shock absorber to absorb that energy before it gets into the structure and just travels throughout the whole house. And so impact noise can be a, a big thing. Same thing with like if you have, um, let's say something on the other side of the wall of your studio that can actually hit the wall and vibrate the wall, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it, it could be a, um, a washing machine or a dryer or something like yeah. that, that vibration can travel through. So trying to isolate all those things uh, to, to help with impact noise, because that's that's a big part of the equation. It's that airborne sound that comes through, but then the impact noise is, is also uh, a detriment. So Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the one, like you said, especially with us doing more basement studios and things like that. Mm -hmm. it, it's not fun being the bearer of bad news, but it's something that really has to be taken care of at the source with those. Yeah, what you don't want to do is go into this building project and think, as soon as I'm done with this, I'm going to have no out exterior noise that I'm going to have to deal with. Right. Like it's it's our job to set expectations and make sure that everybody's on the same page so they, they get what they want. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that wraps up um, some of these top like isolation issues that people can run into. Yeah. Um, this is something that we talk about constantly with clients, just because they're so important and a lot of the, some of, well, not a lot of them, but some of them do get overlooked. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, there's so many things that could go wrong yeah. when you're trying to build a, a well isolated space. And it's just having your eyes on all of these different, different things and making sure that you, you have them handled so that they don't, don't crop up and become an issue. Absolutely. So. 
Well, do you have any last minute thoughts on this? No, I mean, I, I'd say it's all in the details. You know, it's yeah. like making sure that that every little thing, every little step of your construction process is done with uh, always on the lookout for these things that could potentially hurt your isolation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're here as well to help. If you guys ever have any additional questions, things that you are, are fighting with in, in your construction or design of your space, feel free to reach out. Uh, info at haversickdesigns.com is the email address. So you can comment on this video, uh, comment below and, and would love to hear from you. So just really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to watch this. And thanks for being part of the sound project.